Greetings, everyone. Hag Sameach, and welcome to Inversions and Subversions, Leone de Somi's Purim Comedy of Betrothal. Thank you to Bethel Congregation of Phoenix, Arizona, and the East Valley Jewish Community Center in Chandler, Arizona, for their generous support. And we thank Daniel Steinkoken for creating and producing this program, over 460 years in the making, but who's counting? Our appreciation goes as well to Dr. Anna Levenstein, who graciously granted us permission to draw some of the music that we will hear shortly from her doctoral thesis, Songs for the First Hebrew Play. We thank also Nina Cole Garguilo, Daniel Kurek, and Cantor Ingris for performing it, and to Jenny Millinger for assistance with editing. Some clarification is in order at the outset. Neither concert, lecture, or dramatic reading, this presentation is really a mixture of all three. A show lent, if you'll pardon the culinary pun. Uh, not really, I won't. Oh, really? Ah, too bad. I thought it was a good joke. You know, cholent is a mixture of potatoes, beans, onions, eggs, maybe some meat. And here we have a combination of you know, cholent, cholent. All right, fine, I'll move on. In any case, inversions and subversions is what some Israelis might call a hartzaga, a neologism combining hartzaa, lecture, and hatzaga, performance, since we'll be passing back and forth between these modes. So consider yourself forewarned. In any case, we hope that you will find the program enjoyable and informative, and that it will stimulate further interest in Italian Jewish culture, and especially in the writings of Leone de Somme. I should also note that this presentation grows out of an earlier program that I developed and performed together with Ariane Lu, Eric Jaffe Berg, and Elsa Martinez. I remain as grateful for that previous collaboration as I am excited about this current one. And now, without further ado, it's off to Jewish Italy, where we'll hear a snippet of the classic Purim Piut or Hebrew liturgical poem, Ach Ze. Hayom Keviti, the day for which I hoped, directly followed by Fate Onore al Bel Purim, an Italian Purim song that can be traced back to the mid 17th century. Singing is the late Elio Toa, Chief Rabbi of Rome from 1951 to 2002. Arze ayom kiviti, lashir el nigmal tsar, bo matzati raiti, ye shang minam metzar, yang tiru, yak tiru, el moed, morderarim levonab, besim rau birnana. Murderarim levona, besim rao birnana. Fade honor al bel purim, que lo merita in effetto, di voi al triba purim, che cercata ogni diletto, non abbiate alcun sospetto, d'esser tenuti shikorim, fate honor al bel purim, fate honor al bel purim. Fate honor al bel purim, su su belle bachurot, fate torte sinaini, voi zittelle zechenot, cuboletti e moscardini, questi son bei bocconcini, per noi altri ne arim, fate onore al bel purim. Imagine yourself in the northern Italian town of Mantua, in the 1550s. By this point in time, the Venetian ghetto has existed for nearly two generations, and similar walls will in just a few years surround the Jews of Rome, and a little later, in 1570, those of Florence. But in Mantova, as it's called locally, the arrival of the ghetto is still more than half a century in the future, and the community is booming growing to some 2,000 individuals, or 5% of the overall population. Jews are active participants in the rich cultural life 
of the city, the famed Renaissance art historian, Giorgio Vasari, styled a new Rome, and which the Jews themselves referred to as Kirya Aliza, joyous city. One of the most renowned products of Mantuan jewelry was the composer Salomone Rossi, whose setting of Psalm 146 you are listening to now. Alongside its musical achievements, Mantuan Jewry was also known for its theater. By 1525, a company of Jews was performing regularly in the city on the Mincio during the Carnival season, as well as at weddings and other civic events staged by the ruling Gonzaga family. Indeed, performance was a way of currying favor with the Dukes and has even been described as a form of taxation, a way for the Jews of Mantua to pay, or dare I say, to play for their right to reside in the city. Or alternatively, if our Yankee revolutionaries decried taxation without representation, for the Jews of Mantua in the 16th century, it was taxation as representation. This was the world of the author featured in today's program, Yehuda Somo or Leone de Somi Ebreo or Leon Somi the Jew. Sign of the famous Shah Arye Porte Leone or Lionsgate family, known for its distinguished physicians. The Somi's vast literary output included poems, comedies, and pastoral dramas in both verse and prose. He also authored the very first discourse on directing, Quattro Dialoghi in Materia di Rappresentazione Scenica, Four Dialogues on Theatrical Performance. So while he might have produced the very first Lionsgate production, it certainly wasn't the last. Tragically, most of his literary output was destroyed in a great fire at the National Library in Turin in 1904. In Mantua, Leone was associated with a learned society, the Accademia degli Invagiti, or the Academy of the Lovesick, and oversaw theatrical entertainments for the ducal court of Guglielmo Gonzaga. Two kinds of dramatic performance flourished at this time, the Commedia Erudita, learned plays that were fully scripted and often performed by literary academies and young male students, and the Commedia dell'arte, theater performed by mixed professional companies of women and men, using a script that was more of a scenario or blueprint for performance than a fully scripted text. Leone, who wrote fully scripted plays that were at the same time informed and inspired by the Commedia dell'arte, was also active in both Jewish and civic life. He's credited with founding a synagogue and way ahead of his time, even advocated for the creation of a public theater in Mantova. And yet as a Jew, he saw me could not be granted the rank of cavaliere necessary to serve as a courtier, or even it seems a full member of the Invagiti. In the Academy's ledgers, he's identified merely as scrittore accademico, that is, academy writer or scribe. In summary, Leone lived between cultures, negotiating with dukes, a leader among Jews, writing theater in Italian and also daring to do so, controversially, as we shall see, in Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue, that is to say, Hebrew. Now imagine yourself in the Levantine port city of Sidon, located in present-day Lebanon. Hopefully this Feirouz classic will help you to do so. For this is where a comedy of betrothal takes place. This choice of setting for a play in which all of the characters are Jewish should not, on the face of it, be surprising. The land famous for its cedars had long been host to Jewish communities, down, in fact, until well into the second half of the 20th century. Here you see some images, both older and more recent, of the Kenis Saida, or the Saidan Synagogue. And yet we should still pose the question, why Saida as opposed to Montreal? Why the Levant instead of Leone's native Italy? 
For starters, Leone notes in his Dialoghi on performance that, and I quote, an audience delights in seeing foreign and strange costumes on the stage, and therefore recommends setting plays in exotic Eastern locales. But if this is the case, why Sidon and not say Jerusalem? Might Sidon have seen more unusual to the work's original audience? appealed to Leone precisely owing to its status as a liminal space between diaspora and promised land, with some biblical texts placing Sidon inside, others outside, and in one case, directly on the border of Israel. Indeed, we hear of characters coming and going to and from the nearby Galilee region and other locales definitely part of the land of Israel. Leone clearly wants his audience to feel near, but not fully inside, the promised land. Here's now a sample of Lebanese Jewish culture, a traditional Sudanese melody for the poem Yara Dodi Lugano of the great 16th century Paitan or liturgical poet, Israel Najara. Yara. Whatever its precise motivation, this ambiguity with regard to space corresponds nicely to the uncertainty concerning the time in which a comedy of betrothal is set. Are we in antiquity? Leone's present? Somewhere in between? The prominence of rabbinic culture, including of the yeshiva or rabbinic academy in the work, suggests a somewhat later period. Yet the fact that the temple in Jerusalem clearly still stands, references made at one point to a sacrificial offering being made there, points to the period prior to its destruction by the Romans in 70 CE. Perhaps we are best off stating that Leone has here conjured up a fantasy world outside of time in which Jewish ways and institutions are fully intact and unencumbered by the need to engage with a larger and dominant non-Jewish world. After all, a comedy of betrothal was composed for the Jewish holiday of Purim, the Hebrew carnivale, if you will, a day on which inversions and subversions of all sorts are recommended, celebrated, indeed commanded. In the biblical book of Esther, liturgically chanted on this occasion, the planned and looming extermination of all Jews is averted and exchanged for a fantasy of Jewish power and violence. Our Leone seems to have brought 
this impulse to its logical fulfillment in doing away with the deed obliterating from his story the fact of Jewish exile and powerlessness. And this fantasy is closely bound up with and even facilitates his other radical reversal. For while fragments of a Jewish play on the Exodus story, the work of one Ezekiel the tragedian survive from ancient Alexandria in Greek and many a biblical and rabbinic story is awash in dramatic potential. A comedy of betrothal marks the first occasion so far as we are aware, in which the holy language of scripture and prayer of the Shema and Amidah is deployed in a comic drama. Entitled in Hebrew, Zahat Bedev Hu, hmm, I think I need some help with the pronunciation. Sure, Zahut Bedihuta de Kiddushi. It is indeed a mouthful and translates literally as something like, an eloquent comedy of betrothal. It's not clear if the title was Leonis, but whoever thought it up was clearly having some fun. The Hebrew term sahut, or eloquence, is the title of a work on Hebrew grammar composed back in 1145 by the renowned philosopher and biblical commentator, Abraham Ibn Ezra, in, of all places, Mantova. So the use of that same term in this play's name may well be meant to evoke its distinguished Mantuan predecessor. Leone was certainly familiar with this text. He translated it into Italian at the ripe old age of 11. In addition, the term tzachut refers in the Hebrew grammatical tradition to pure language. Yet the complete phrase comprising this title is anything but. Bedihuta and Kiddushin are both actually Aramaic terms. Aramaic being a Semitic language closely related to yet distinct from Hebrew and widely used by Jews. So the title of this play is a linguistic hybrid, clearly intentional, by the way, since Hebrew equivalents could easily have been used instead. And given that the word used here for marriage, Kedushin, stems from the Hebrew root Kadesh, meaning sanctify, there appears to be an element of play. Leonid has given us a comedy on holy matters. Indeed, a comedy involving the holy tongue itself. Regardless of whether there had been earlier Hebrew drama or not, Leone writes self-consciously, as if his is the first and as if his choice of language is therefore in need of justification. For help in this, he turns to a heavy hitter indeed, wisdom, personified as a woman, with whom the play opens. גם כי נודע בשערים טעמי, ומלא כל הארץ כבודי, כי כל הגויים קרו בשמי, עם כל זה בירותכם את תמונות פניי ידעתי. מיס וויזדום, אקסקיוז מי. כי אין איש שם הלב מהנוחי. מיס וויזדום, אקסקיוז מי פור דה מומנט, פליז. ומה מלאכתי, ומה המה הפיירות והקרטרים. גברת חוכמה. מה? What is it? Can't you see I'm trying to get the show rolling? אה, גברת חוכמה, מיס וויזדום. Yes, but um, do you realize where you are? Am I not in the first Hebrew language play? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, do you not realize where the audience is? They're all at home, in front of their screens, no? <laughs> Fine, yes, that's true too. Um, but you realize that we're putting this on in Arizona, right? Ah, ¿por qué no lo habías dicho antes? Órale, ya, comencemos. Soy la mujer que... La señora sabiduría. Okay, then in English, if you prefer. Sí, por favor. Okay. I... The woman standing before you today, although my understanding is known in the gates and in the entire world full of my glory, for all the nations call upon my name, nevertheless, 
I am aware that hardly a man truly takes to heart who I am and what is my work. Not to mention why I walk around with this crown on my head. That's why I decided to come out to you today, my dear friends, to make myself known to you. And why should I be embarrassed or ashamed to reveal my glory before you, this great audience? Here, it is worth mentioning that Lady Wisdom's coming forward to reveal her glory contrasts strikingly with the behavior of another regal woman, one directly associated with the holiday of Purim, Queen Vashti's refusal at the very beginning of the Book of Esther to accede to King Ahasuerus's request to display her great beauty, that is, to appear naked before his court, sets that work's plot in motion, just as does Wisdom's appearance here. But don't forget that Leone here draws upon an ancient Jewish understanding of wisdom as a quasi-divine figure drawn upon by God in the creation of the world and the execution of various miracles. Okay, however... Oh, 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 and that the choice of wisdom to open the play also represents a kosher equivalent to the Greek and Roman gods who typically appear at the outset of Italian comedies from this period. Great, but- Hey, you know what else? There's also a more contemporary resonance. Just a few decades earlier, another Jewish Leo, Leone Ebreo, or Judah Abravanel, had composed his Dialogues of Love, Dialoghi di Amore, which featured three dialogues between Philo and Sophia, which means love and wisdom in Greek. Thank you. But let us skip now to the part where wisdom addresses the question of Hebrew directly. I have observed that the wise of the Gentiles in their languages and lands in Persia, Greece, Rome, and Turkey take pride in how they deploy language to delight mankind. Their works have been performed before men of distinction and high degree. And in their words, pleasure and utility are perfectly conjoined. Now, some playwrights among the Gentiles have looked down upon the Jews because they have seemed to lack this literary facility. It is for this reason that I have this day resolved to show to all the peoples that the Hebrew language is not inferior in its artistic power to the other languages. And what was considered a crown for the head among the other languages for the holy tongue was but the mere heel of a shoe. And as for what you are about to hear, even if it is new for Hebrew, it would excel all others in the creation of parables, in the creation of riddles, which delight mankind. So please, dear listeners, give no credence to the insolent speech of those arrogant purveyors of fraud, who contend that it is improper to deploy the holy language for profane matters. For if they would only pay close attention to the story I have said before you today, they will realize that its foundation is in a tale told by our ancient sages who spoke in my name. You must be referring to the rabbinic midrash Tanhuma on the Torah portion Lech Lecha. Here, the midrash tells of a man departing on a long trip and his virtuous, studious son. Sensing that he would soon die, the father willed his property to the servant who was with him, granting his son the choice of but one of his possessions. Upon hearing of this stipulation, the son approached his rabbi, who wisely advised him to choose- Exactly, exactly, exactly. Dear audience, listen closely to how Leone's play recapitulates this scenario. And please, also bear in mind that this play was composed to bring praise, fame, and glory, to exalt and magnify the Torah, to study and teach, to keep and to do good in the eyes of God and man. So take that, oh, the tractors. Chachma, wow. You've managed to work in Ecclesiastes, Psalms, blessings before the Shema, Birkat Hamazon, any other traditional texts you want to throw in there? 
מספיק כבר, לא? No, I'm done, I rest my case. Now it is on to Act One, in which Amon and Deborah discuss the approaching marriage of their daughter. Proclaim to the citizens of our city that in joy and gladness we propose to marry our daughter Baruria to the handsome Yedidia. Our most sincere and heartfelt expectation is that the future bridegroom's father Sholem will return safely from Damascus, that we, we may be able to consummate the marriage of our children during Purim, and so unite our two families. Hey! Who is more concerned about all these arrangements than me? For months, all I have been thinking about is how to make sure that our daughter has the things she needs the gaily embroidered linen, the fancy sheeting and pillow slips, the fine hats and cloaks, the splendid dresses and accessories. In short, that she has the most complete trousseau of any Jewish girl about to be a bride. I should scold you for the extravagant way in which you women deliberately throw money around. Such behavior has no real purpose except to serve your vanity, it neither helps nor profits anyone. I should find you that newly printed poem on the glory of women so that you could learn from better example. Oh, where is it now? If you would only clean my office like you're supposed to. Excuse me, Amon, Deborah, but I can't let that remarkable instance of product placement and self-promotion pass by without comment. For that newly printed poem you just mentioned must be none other than de Somi's own bilingual Magen Nashim, in which Hebrew and Italian lines are interlaced within the stanzas of the poem. To give you a feel for the type of effect created, listen to this. Hit it, Canner. Shimona et divrati 
Donne se agoneste belle, chi a huda hidati, contra queste chiurme felle, te li vechi chiale stelle, e luet her patren, va anima gela hen, Per defender via, oni via, a ah, oni via. Nashim ha ivriot, hegia for roll tempo antico, ha sidot gam neviot, anar ar nomia fatico, hese mile lodio dico, ema hergar gir hadal, to hayam al kenechtal. Alaudar Rachel Olia, Rachel Olia. That was stanzas one and twenty-one of Magen Nashim in defense of women. The poem was a creative retort against those within the Jewish community who objected to using Italian and Hebrew side by side. Its first part highlights the ways in which men have wronged women before celebrating in many stanza length biographies, distinguished females from the Greek, Roman and Jewish pasts, including, of course, Queen Esther. And it closes with praise of Leone's own beloved who is left unnamed. It's fascinating to encounter a bilingual poem engaging with relations between men and women. For just as Mangain Nashim seamlessly intertwines Hebrew and Italian, a testament to Leone's own hybrid identity, it also attempts to resolve the ongoing conflict between the sexes. Back to you, Deborah, and good luck. I don't deny, dear husband, that we disagree on the question of dowers, but as we are both fully aware, Yadidya is a good boy, intelligent and handsome too. To my mind, there is none like him anywhere. Oi vey, we're in serious trouble. Did you see that chat that just came in? It's about Sholem and it brings terrible news. Terrible! It says that Sholem has passed away in Damascus. Baruch Dayan HaEmet. Blessed be the true judge. I am so sorry to hear such awful news. But why do you need to make things worse by mourning him? Doesn't death come to everyone? And hey, Yaditi has got quite an inheritance. That's just it. Oh, how can I hold back and how can I speak it out when I see that my in-law, Sholem, has taken all the joy out of my life? While they were in Damascus, Sholem wheeled everything to Shovel, his servant. What a calamity! Thank the good Lord that the marriage has not been finalized. Amen! There's still the chance that one way or another we can find the happiness for our daughter that she richly deserves. But am I not obliged to give her in marriage to Sholem's son this very week? Granted, you gave your solemn promise, but there isn't the least doubt in my mind that you are completely absolved of it now because his father made a mockery of the agreement with you when he handed over his wealth to a total stranger rather than to his own son. 
Just because Sholem failed to do what was right, does that permit me to break my solemn word? The promises I make, I keep. Look, there is no question of solemn promises here. I don't want to waste any more words on the matter. Shut up, dear wife, or I'm going to remove you from this meeting. You'll wake the entire household with your racket. I don't want Beruria to know about this terrible misfortune. Well, then it won't be any problem for you because I'm resolved to say nothing to her until we can get her another bridegroom. That's the only way out of this distressing situation. But why have you suddenly reversed your good opinion of Yedidya? Because from the moment that Sholem changed his mind, I have hated him intensely. I don't feel sorry for his son either because now he's been made a bastard. The only reason I would look at him is to give him the evil eye. If that's your opinion of him, that's your opinion. But what about my view? Really now, how can you deliver your sweet and innocent child over to a miserable wretch who's despised and rejected without a penny to his name? Are you going to endow this poverty-stricken fellow with all your worldly wealth? The character that Yadidya had a few days ago was the character that Yadidya has today. Isn't he still bright and clever? With the aid of such generous endowments, he'll regain the wealth he had before and build back better. Quite possibly, husband. But the fact remains, He's a lot poorer now than last night. How, how can you compare being bright and clever with money? How can you compare a soul with a body? A soul gives life. Without it, the body is nothing, a nobody. Money likewise brings things to life. And without it, life can be pretty deadly. To have character only means something is lacking. Just to be bright is dumb unless one has something in the hand. How can I force my daughter into a life of poverty and make her a laughing stock? That I shall never, never allow. I'm leaving this meeting now, but believe me, what I want, I'll get. <laughs>
In the meantime, Yadidia finds out that the marriage is off, though he remains unaware of the cause of the broken engagement, that is, his father's passing, until very late in the play. And once Deborah and Amon realize that another man, Ephron's son, Asael, is eligible, they contrive to betroth him to Bururia, their daughter, and to send her off to the country, away from Yadidia. Desperate for Bururia, Yadidia appears and attempts to convince her to marry him after all. Yadidia, how can I defy the decision of my parents without completely disgracing myself? You will not be disgraced and you will not be ashamed. For as is customary among the maidens of Israel, lo bikashtavar, you did not demand a particular husband, but accepted unquestioningly the one your parents picked out for you, although it is right and proper that maidens be consulted in their choice of husbands. So you're asking nothing but that they go along with what they originally told you to do, to accept willingly and lovingly him, I mean me, Yedidia, as your husband. Did you not do as they bade you? Now, even if they kill you, you could not turn your heart about and stop loving me. Heaven knows that I intended to ask this, but then in order to prevent me, they quickly brought in a messenger without letting me know beforehand. He placed a golden chain around my neck. In my innocence, thinking it was a token of affection from you, I gladly accepted it. Then and there, a loud proclamation was made throughout the house that by accepting the gift, I was forthwith betrothed to Asael, the son of Ephraim. Upon hearing this announcement, I became petrified with fear. I had no strength left to raise my voice in protest, but remained in a state of shock, my eyes fixed on the floor. And before I could recover my senses, everyone had gone, and I was left alone, alarmed by what had occurred and terrified for what was going to happen to me. How can my soul be separated from my body without perishing outright? My love, please don't think ill of me if by daylight I go in disguise to the country so that once again I may see the bright beauty of your face that quickens my failing spirits. Your visit will revive my spirits as well. But I'm terrified of my mother's ill temper were she to find you there. I will transform my appearance so that none except you can identify me. Do as you see fit, but please know that while I openly profess my affection for you, I still cannot violate my honor. Now I must go inside to my mother, for I can stay no longer, much as I should like. Remember me and don't forget an innocent maid.
one like a blind man groping at noon from whom the sun already has set. Pashkur, my servant, have you deserted me? Why is the space about you so dark and sunless? Tell me, what shall I do? Where shall I turn? Upon whom shall I rely? Here I am. Take my advice if you want to get out of this dilemma. It is crystal clear that Baruria's love for you is stronger than death. Her heart is ever yours. Therefore, since she has not betrayed your trust by unwillingly accepting another man as her husband, you just elope with her according to the law of faithful lovers. The Mishnah Tractate Kedushin on marriage commences with the statement, a woman is acquired by her husband, that is, in three ways through money, through a document, or through sexual intercourse. Pashkor has number three in mind. But she's betrothed to another. How could I do this great evil? Where have I heard that line before? Does this help? Why are you laning? Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Ah, but of course, Genesis 39. Now Joseph was handsome and good looking, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. He thought about it, but he refused. And he said to his master's wife, How could I do this great evil and sin against God? Thanks. And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. Well, we all know how that ended up with Joseph in prison. But what about you? Would you rather kill yourself and so put an end to your soul as well as your body? Do as I tell you so that you won't have to die. I'll clear the way of stumbling blocks, just like Isaiah said. And get hold of yourself so that you will not be blown away by every contrary wind. I'll distract your mother, Deborah, while you take Bruria out to the field where... How did Jacob put it to his beloved son, Joseph? You will be blessed with the blessings of the breast and of the womb. I can't say whether your plan is bad or good until I consult with Reb Hamdan. Only then will I decide how to proceed. Unlike Joseph, who holds back from ever sleeping with Potiphar's wife, Yedidia, after consulting his rather unscrupulous rabbi, does, in the end, follow his servant's advice, and our two lovers engage in some rather intense and enjoyable <clears throat> field work. Here, too, echoes of the biblical Joseph abound. The Hebrew term that Leone uses for the gown in which Beruria was decked out for this encounter, kutonet hapasim, is the same as that employed for Joseph's amazing technicolor dream coat. Thus, the feminine qualities noted by scholars in the biblical depiction of Joseph are put here to good use.
Alas, despite Yadidia's best efforts, word of his tryst with Beruria gets out, and he is seized and placed under arrest. What is the charge, Ms. Bailiff? The magistrate has ordered that you be made to answer to the accusation of rape that had been brought against you by a maiden of Israel, that you did come upon her while she was alone in a field remote from human habitation so that there was none to hear her when she did cry aloud for help. Our Leone here has brought to life a theoretical case raised in the book of Deuteronomy. What happens when a man sleeps with a woman engaged to another? Scripture tells us that should this take place in a city, both the male and female should be stoned to death. The man for violating his neighbor's future wife, the woman whom it's presumed did not cry out for help for her complicity in the act. But if on the other hand, it occurs in a field then only the man is held responsible and subject to capital punishment. In this case, it's assumed that the woman did call out, but there was no one around to come to her rescue. In our play, Beruria does call out, but only once she has noticed the presence of her maidservant, Yakara. Prior to that, the noises she emitted do not bear signs of distress. In the intercourse between the two lovers, at a comedy of betrothal's climax, so to speak, Leona sets up a stark confrontation between biblical and rabbinic law. Has Yedidia consummated marriage with his beloved Beruria, unfairly denied him by her parents? Or has he raped the young woman now engaged to another? Arrested and charged with the latter, Yedidia now believes he has no escape from death and sarcastically confesses to a whole slew of crimes he could not have possibly committed. Concluding, I have chosen death over life. And that is the ominous note on which the penultimate act concludes. Oh, hey. 
shamaim ba'aretz aliten lamot raglecha al yanum shomerecha hine lo yanum velo ishan shomer Yisrael adonai. Al yad yeminecha Yom am Hashem eshlo yakecha Ve'areach balayla Adonai yishmorcha mikol ra Yishmor et nafshe Adonai, Yishmor Tzaytecha Uvoecha Me'atha ve'ad Olam me'atha ve'ad Many a play requires a deus ex machina to arrive at its final resolution. Being a good Jew, Desomi has no god or goddess on hand and has, alas, already played the Lady Wisdom card. So he now turns to truth, or more accurately, Rabbi Truthbringer, Rav Amitai, a veritable foil to the Reb Hamdan, or Greedy, encountered earlier, in achieving the great inversion, or Better yet, inversions that close out his comedy of betrothal. Still, Gvert Hochma has not been forgotten in this final act. For as Rav Amitai says to Amon, Both honor and glory would have been yours if only you had not let your emotions sway you while investigating an important matter, but had Instead, let wisdom prevail. Amon might then have had honor and glory, but there would not have been a play, nor this program. In any case, Rabbi Amitai's first task is to secure Amon's confession and contrition for the pain and humiliation he caused Yedidya in first approving and then retracting the young man's engagement to his daughter. Rabbi Amitai accomplishes this in a manner sure to please Jewish feminists the world over by threatening to force Amon to drink the cup of wrath from the oppressor, Mei Hamarim, the bitter water that swells the belly. The language here unmistakably recalls that of the book of Numbers chapter five, where at the Lord's behest, Moses informs the Israelites how they are to test the fidelity of a wife to her husband. She is to be brought to a priest along with some barley flour, the grain offering of jealousy. Then the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. The priest shall set the woman before the Lord, dishevel the woman's hair, and place in her hands the grain offering of jealousy. In his own hand, the priest shall have the water of bitterness that brings the curse, and shall make the woman drink it. If the suspected woman, in Hebrew known as a sota, is innocent of adultery, this, what we might call sota, water, will have no effect on her. But should she be guilty, then her belly will swell and her uterus will fall. In our play, Rav Amitai warns Ammon that drinking this water will cause his belly to swell and the members of his household will fall into plague and violence and famine. Thus, the author of Magen Nashim in defense of women 
Here shifts the locus classicus for unfair treatment of women onto a man. Inversion one. Amon conveys remorse for the pain and disruption caused Yedidya, but still insists on the validity of Beruria's engagement to Asael. All for naught. Since shortly thereafter, we learned that alarmed by all the gossip swirling around Beruria, her new betrothed has decided to call the whole thing off himself. It was precisely because Amon had annulled the engagement between Beruria and Yedidya that Yedidya aimed to consummate the marriage with Beruria in the only manner left <clears throat> open to him. And that is what now leads Asael to walk away. And if Yedidya's engagement to Beruria was canceled over his apparent newfound poverty, Asael calls off his despite the substantial wealth he stood to gain from the marriage. Thus Amon, who at the outset of a comedy of betrothal was so quick to discard the engagement with Yedidya, now finds himself pleading in vain to Asael's father to honor their agreement. What goes around comes around in version number two. For in version number three, we can thank the insight of Rabbi Amitai of Bethel Congregation Sidon, the legal genius of their time, who discerned the great cleverness in Sholem's decision to leave all his property in the hands of his servant while away from home, except when you read the fine print for a single parcel of his estate. Since whatever a slave acquires belongs to his master, all Yedidya needed to do was to select Shoval as his parcel, and all his father's property became his. This, of course, paved the way for inversion number four, official recognition of Yedidya and Baruria as man and wife. Yedidya. Also, you plotted to place an obstacle in the way of the righteous person. God reckoned it for the good. His mercy and truth have not deserted you, and he has translated impudence into modesty of spirit. Therefore, he will not reprimand you for your devious behavior in any degree. For Bruria's love has rendered it honest. Now, as well, her compassion will combine with that love to form golden links in a chain that will join the two families and make them one. Beautiful. While well, Rabbi Amitai thus credits Bruria's love with healing the breach between the two families, there is something undeniably subversive about the two lovers having taken matters into their own hands, so to speak. The image of the golden chain uniting the two families ironically recalls the necklace that Baruria's parents gave her from her second suitor in a ruse to get her to accept a husband other than Yedidia. Baruria and Yedidia succeed in getting married but they do so by directly disobeying their parents, flouting the powers and responsibilities of their seniors, not to mention the commandment to honor one's father and mother. Inversion and subversion number five, the younger generation gets the better of their elders. Oh, the Oh, the ha, oh, the ha, ki anitan. 
If these myriad inversions suit the play's Purim setting perfectly, so does the brief interlude of nonsense rabbinic learning, popularly known as Purim Torah, that Leone places in the mouths of Yair and Yoktan, two of the least impressive bohers or bachelors in Reb Hamdan's yeshiva, aware that their rabbi's daughter is soon to wed, and that he is therefore quite distracted. They are quite hopeful. That the immortal words of the prophet Micah, lo yom edun od, and they shall never again learn, will soon be fulfilled. Yehi ratzon venomar, amen. May it be God's will and let us say amen. We have of course done battle against the last word of the phrase, milchama or war, but please don't tell anyone. It anyway doesn't make much difference. For the entire month just past, we've done absolutely no stegging at all and have forgotten whatever we had previously learned. Even if Reb Hamda and that greedy bastard should come check on us right now, I'm not scared a single bit since I've thought up a kushia question to stump Torah scholars the world over. For we read in the Megillah. Vayitlu et Haman al ha'etz, that they hanged Haman. Whereas in the Torah, we read that the Israelites were instructed to eat Haman. How can they eat a hanged man? Nothing could be less kosher. That's your tough question? Come on. Rav Bilam ben Bibi solved that Haman shan Shanim years ago. The injunction to eat Haman is fulfilled by eating those fine pastries modeled after his ears. Ozne Haman, what those crazy Ashkenazim, for some reason, inexplicable reason, call Hamantashen, Haman's pockets. And after all, it says in the Torah that Haman should taste like wafers made with honey, nice and sweet. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And now, after all of these inversions and subversions, with this pressing legal conundrum at last resolved, and all of these loose ends of our plot nicely tied up like the corners of a hamantashen. But one task remains, to thank all of the participants in this program for their participation. We wish you all as happy a Purim as possible in these strangest of times. Thank you, and toda, grazie, and gracias. After Purim comes Pesach, and so as we begin to look ahead to the next holiday, Cantor Angris will close things off for us with a lovely Italian rendition of Psalm 114, but Seit Yisrael Mimitzrayim, when Israel went forth from Egypt. Beit Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, Beit Yaakov me Amloes, Haita Yehuda legocho, Yisrael mam shelokav. Beit Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, Beit Yaakov me Amloes, Haita Yehuda lekocho, Yisrael mam shelotav. Beit Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, Beit Yaakov me Amloes, Haita Yehuda lekocho, Yisrael mam shelotav. 